I'd run off and not cry. Here comes your father. When kids in the village would sing that in front of dad. Say so yeah. Oh sorry. You'd get so angry. Yo! Yeah. Sorry. Son, walk like a man. Our sister would catch us wearing your stuff. But I thought I looked pretty. A dancers in the village. I'd wanna put on that two-wing a headdress. Then, the whole village would stare. It was dark. The light went dark. And I felt nothing. Here comes your father. 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 But I'd go to the mountain. And dance by the waterfall. Being free was a beautiful thing. If I leave, I'll take my roots with me. A piece of home to carry. In my blood. Hold on tight. As I shift in the wind, I'll land and plant these pieces. And I'll grow. Walk like a man, Yoko. That's what Dad used to yell. No. I reckon I'll walk just like me. Folks, years of research were spent to bring real-time global illumination and reflections to Unreal Engine, which resulted in Lumen. In our latest video overview, Lumen in UE5, Let There Be Light, we share exactly what it is, discuss its features, and walk you through a high-level overview of how it works. Head over to the Unreal Engine YouTube channel to get started. 
All right, educators, hold your students' attention with one of the most popular games in the world. With our free Fortnite Creative Lesson Plans, you can explore science, design, and history concepts using a dynamic game environment. Find these materials on the Unreal Engine blog. Give yourself extra fuel with our dedicated learning path for the 2021 Epic Mega Jam, our exciting seven-day game jam kicking off August 26th. Featuring courses on getting started in UE, packaging, and more, this series will help you be ready. And you can earn a limited time event badge for completing it by September 16th. Register now on itch.io and start the courses via the Unreal Online Learning Portal. How do you make an already great game even better? The developers at Square Enix share how they took advantage of PlayStation 5's extra performance power to bolster Final Fantasy VII Remake's lighting, frame rate, VFX, load times, and more for Intergrade. Get the deets on the feed. Creating an animated short film in less than three months with a very small team while working from home is no small feat. But that's exactly what one Cornish studio has achieved. Adapted from wordless children's book Wilder, explore how the Engine House team created their film with final pixels rendered entirely in Unreal. When Scavenger Studio revealed Season at the 2020 Game Awards, unsurprisingly, adoration for its beautiful 2D illustrative art style poured in, and we had to know what inspired them and how they pulled it off. The Montreal-based team shares a peek behind their stunning visuals on the feed. Don't miss it! Increasingly, the products you see advertised in commercials are CG replicas, not footage of the actual product. These digital twins are becoming the norm. Steer over to the feed to learn how the power of AWS cloud computing and real-time rendering has been combined in Macavision's new render-on-demand system, offering a way to create personalized, photorealistic marketing assets in seconds. Using virtual production and digital human tech, Madison Beer, Sony Music, and Magnopus have set a new bar for virtual concerts thrilling fans who had no choice but to stay home. The real-time techniques enabled them to bring the same digital experiences to fans around the world. Go backstage and learn how they composed the Madison Beer Immersive Reality Concert Experience. If you're ready to explore the latest virtual production features in Unreal Engine 427, join us on Wednesday, August 25th for a free webinar. We'll reveal more about how this release will unlock new potential for the creation of both live action and animated content and talk about how the explosive growth of in-camera VFX and broadcast virtual graphics inspired the development of 427. Register today! And now over to this week's Top Karma Earners, many, many, many thanks to Clockwork Ocean, Every Nun, Grimya, Luna Nellis, Danny Mazur, Fatal Break, Death Ray, Sakash, Light Canadian, and Shadow River. Our first community spotlight this week is a video series created in homage to Dragon Age from Leo Therese. These lovely scenes served as a playground for trying out Lumen and Nanite in UE5 Early Access. Go get more tech details and give your feedback to Leo on the forums. Coming at you from Grimware Games, Ghost Knight, A Dark Tale is a 2.5D action platformer set in a cartoonish dark fantasy world. As Ghost Knight, a spirit bound to a suit of armor, traverse the dark land of undead demons, witches, and beasts to stop the Mad King's misled quest and free Laurentia. Wishlist Ghost Knight now on Steam. In celebration of the 20th anniversary of the game Golden Sun, the Virtual Video Game Orchestra released an arrangement of Prologue by Jonathan Shaw. Built in Unreal, the video showcases musicians from all over the world and allows the editor to quickly shape the performance. Watch the full event in the forums. Thanks for watching this week's news and community spotlight. Hi, and welcome to Inside Unreal, a weekly show where we learn, explore, and celebrate everything Unreal. I'm your host, Amanda Shade, and we're excited to get started today. We're going to talk about Unreal Engine 427 and some of the exciting updates that are coming. And to help me do so, we have Andy Blondin, Senior Product Manager. Hello, everyone. Um, here at Epic, I work with the virtual production team on some of the features, and today 
Uh, we'll be covering a bunch of the things that we've put into 427. So look forward to chat. And Antoine Guillo, product specialist for AEC. Hey, everyone. Um, so I work on DataSmith, data prep, and some other features like uh, LiDAR, doing some QA and, and getting you guys feedback. Awesome. Uh, Chris Kola, principal rendering engineer. Hey everyone, I uh, work on the ray tracing group here at Epic. I've uh, been here about a year, uh, come from a film and visual effects background, and I'll be talking about some of the stuff I've been doing. Thanks. Ryan Maeda, Senior Technical Product Manager, live from an LED stage. Hi everyone, I'm Ryan. Um, I'm a Pisces, and I live in <laughs> LA. Uh, so I'm, I'm one of the product managers on virtual production. I work really closely with Andy. Um, and excited to talk about the stuff we have coming in. Awesome. And Steve Smith, our XR lead. Yeah, hi, I'm Steve Smith. I'm in the Seattle office. Um, so a little north of LA. And uh, I lead the XR team on the engine, doing all things AR and VR in Unreal Engine. Awesome. All right. Well, first of all, thank you all so much for coming. Uh, we have a lot of really cool content to share today uh, to give the folks at home some uh, we're going to start off with Steve. He's got some XR updates for us, and then he's got to dip out. So we'll let him take it away and dive right in. Awesome. Thank you, Amanda. Uh, OK, in the world of XR, we've got three things to note for 427 that I wanted to talk about. Um, first, OpenXR being production ready. Uh, we've also added some fixed foveation VRS support for desktop VR, um, which is currently experimental. And uh, we also added uh, new VR and AR templates. So first, OpenXR. For 4.27, um, our OpenXR support is now officially out of beta and is considered production ready. Uh, so historically, to support um, VR and, and um, head-mounted AR in UE4, you'd need to enable a bunch of different plugins for different runtimes. Uh, new devices, they'd need to support existing runtimes, or a game would have to be ported to support a new runtime. With OpenXR, we now have a single surface to support all the things. So this is going to make life simpler for you guys, for the developers, since there's just one plugin now and you've got consistent behavior. And it's really a boon for us on the XR team as well, since now we're going to have more bandwidth to focus on innovation. And uh, speaking of innovation, um, VRS is a pretty cool new feature. So we've added experimental support for image-based VRS for 427. Uh, so currently, that's only focused on XR use cases, specifically fixed foveation in a VR headset. So uh, you're probably wondering, or you may be wondering, what is VRS? So the TLDR for, for that is, um, we can basically provide an image for the GPU that is going to describe how much detail to use in different parts of the frame buffer. So by default, it's always a, a one by one shading rate. So that's one invocation of a pixel shader per on-screen pixel. So VRS can actually allow us to define groupings of up to four by four pixels, so groups of 16 uh, per single pixel shader invocation and then various combinations below that. So for the, uh, the VR fixed foveation use case, we can reduce the shading rate towards the edges of the view with uh, virtually no visual impact due to the, uh, the lens distortion. Uh, so on the slide there, you can actually see the, the picture of the motorbikes. The red shading there um, actually shows what that fixed foveation um, attachment looks like. So we've actually seen significant performance improvements using this. Um, in some experimentation I did actually saw the base pass time uh, on the GPU cut in half when using uh, aggressive fixed foveation. Uh, currently, this is only supported on DX12, um, but we've got a Vulkan implementation in the works, um, probably for, for UE5. Uh, it's exposed through a new setting under the renderer settings in the engine in the VR section. Uh, we're definitely going to be continuing to refine and improve on this tech since the initial results through, through experimentation have been so good. Uh, we're looking at adding eye track based foveated rendering and future release for headsets that support it. Um, and we're also going to be looking at extending this tech beyond just VR use cases. So it's definitely worth keeping an eye on. Um, also, we, you know, we've, we've added the new VR and AR templates. So the new handheld AR template, um, greatly improved UX design. It's a great starting point for any handheld AR applications, and it runs both on Android and iOS. And we've also added a completely new VR template. So our old VR template was definitely not the best example of uh, VR and Unreal Engine, did not age well. Uh, our new template is significantly improved. It's all new content. It's designed specifically around OpenXR as well. Uh, and it shows best practices for room scale uh, VR. So Victor Broden is actually going to be talking about that in an upcoming live, live stream on September 2nd. So 
tune in for that for more details. So that's everything from the XR team for 427. I'm going to hand off to Ryan, who's going to go into virtual production and in-camera VFX. All right. Thank you so much, Steve. Thank you. Cool. So uh, once again, I'm Ryan. Uh, so I'm coming to you looking live here from the Epic Games Lard stage uh, at Nant Studios. So we call it the Lard stage, which is technically the Los Angeles R&D stage. Uh, but a bunch of us have been here, um, you know, making sure that all of the features going into 427 are going to work on real stages. Um, and so that kind of starts with a big production test we did. Um, next slide. Uh, so this has been posted already. Hopefully a lot of you have seen it. If you haven't, um, you know, can, should be easy to find uh, on our website. Uh, but over the past several months, like we were putting together uh, like a big, like a production test. We were shooting real shots, um, you know proving things out as far as like all of the new features that were coming in 4.27, uh, just as a way of making sure that that uh, the next release is ready to go for, for real productions that are going to go to shoot with this. Um, in addition, we there's a bunch of behind the scenes stuff talking with the different different filmmakers that we that were participating in it with us, as well as like our dev team, the people that were building the features and, and working, working hard behind the scenes uh, to have our code base ready to go. Um, so like, I mean, I guess with that in mind, it, it also thought it might be good to just maybe give a little bit of context on in-camera VFX, just like what it is. Uh, so next slide. Um, oh, sorry, I, I actually skipped ahead. Uh, the last thing to mention related to our production test is that we are sharing the sample content. So if you watch the production test, uh, you'll see that it goes through a number of different scenes. And all of these scenes are gonna be available in this uh, sample project that's gonna accompany the 427 release. Um, so there's like three new scenes that are, are part of this. And then um, if you also watch the piece, we're using the uh, Memories of Australia uh, asset pack, which is already available in the marketplace. Um, so next up is like maybe a, a little bit of stuff I prepped just to give people some, some background on what in-camera VFX is. Uh, so next slide shows, uh, this is just what the stage looks like when it's populated with an environment. You get a sense for what is physical and what is virtual. Uh, so like everything that you see on the wall, like as you would like, when we replace the grid with the real scene here is is like a full uh, real-time environment. Um, and the other thing that, to note about the stage space itself is that it's immersive. So like in addition to being uh, what you see in the background, it's also an immersive space that like also lights the characters, gives real-time reflections like in the physical objects. Uh, so the next slide shows the kind of way that the camera works. Uh, so another thing to note here is that we are using a live track camera. And like this in particular, I think it's a, it's a, it's kind of a good way of showing how like game development is, is changing the way and transforming the way that that movies and TV shows are made, right? So like when you're playing a game, when you're accustomed to being the, you're accustomed as the player to controlling what the camera sees, where the camera goes. Um, and in camera VFX is kind of the same concept, but like the director, cinematographer, camera operator, et cetera, like they're the player and, and they're live controlling what the camera sees and where it goes physically, right? So we're moving the camera physically and it's adjusting what the camera sees in this picture and picture is always like the correct perspective of the camera. Um, so next slide kind of shows that in action, right? So this is sort of better than just like a 2D image or, or, like, a, or like a video playing behind because no matter where the camera goes, it's always seeing like an accurate perspective of what you're supposed to see. Um, so inside of where the camera moves, like where the what the camera sees is always moving and what's outside of it remains still because that's what shows up in the lighting and reflections. Um, the idea here is like we're providing like the directors like a more, um, you know, more tactile way, like like shooting virtually in a way that feels a lot more like how they're shooting if they're actually at the location. Um, so that all kind of start to segue back into like the actual features that are coming. So next slide. Um, is uh, yeah, so like diving into the features for 427, we're really, uh, we feel really confident about about um, this collection of features that, that are all part of the engine that are necessary for in-camera VFX. Uh, the idea here is that this in-camera VFX workflow is now something that anybody can do. Um, I think the big ticket items to call through are, are multi-GPU support. So what this means is that you're able to use uh, computers to drive the wall that have more than one GPU. Uh, this allows us to scale better for large volumes, right? So this is a pretty big one. Like some, some of the productions that we're seeing are, are much larger even to accommodate the types of like epic scenes that they wanna produce. Um, but with multi-GPU, you're able to use one GPU that, that's dedicated to the pixels that you see in camera, and you use another GPU uh, to drive what's outside for lighting and reflections. Um, this gives a lot more flexibility for content creation. It's just basically a lot more uh, graphics horsepower to, to keep like the, the, you know, to keep the, 
it's key things the horsepower driving like the content that you actually see uh, in 427 we've optimized for two gpus for, per machine uh, we're definitely exploring uh, other options to like sort of take this further but this is kind of a big jump from one to two and it also allows us to um, um, reduce the total number of machines like kind of bring the cost down hopefully as well um, and you know all of this is kind of in service of this idea that filmmakers can make turn around live creative changes during a shoot, right? So the scene is always live. Uh, you're able to make real time changes just like you do in the editor. And that's gonna be reflected in what you see on screen. Uh, so next slide is for multiple cameras. Uh, so this is another thing that we just wanna call out and um, the multi GPU performance stuff really helps with it. Um, but it's very common to shoot with multiple cameras and you're able to do this on the LED wall. This is a kind of a little example that shows how it works, right? So you, you have two cameras, you also get two like kind of frustums that, that are tracked to each camera. Uh, and with MGPU, it just, again, leaves, leaves more of the graphics horsepower available to drive more than one camera. Um, we've also made a bunch of um, optimizations and workflow improvements just to make it easier to configure. So the idea is that with N-Display, um, you're configuring like the, all the numbers of cameras you need and, and you just turn them on and off as you, as you see fit. Uh, and then you're only um, rendering uh, the cameras that you have enabled. Uh, next slide covers traveling shots. So traveling shots is a very common thing. I think we're all accustomed to, to seeing maybe some, you know, not some fake looking car driving shots. Uh, this is a really, um, it's a really common workflow that, that people are using the LED walls for. Uh, and so we have some, some big improvements on the rendering side to make this look more realistic. Um, the first thing has to do with motion blur. So with the way that the background is moving. Uh, and so with this feature or with this release, we've introduced a feature that allows uh, you and display to disable the camera motion blur. Cause the idea here is that like the objects are moving, you want the object motion blur, but the camera motion blur is gonna be coming from like the physical camera as it's moving. Um, so this is, this was like a really kind of, a, seems like a subtle thing, but it's, it's, it's what makes the image look more realistic. So you're not getting uh, excessively motion blurred uh, background images and reflections. Um, that's more related to the 3D side of things. On the 2D side, uh, our team has done a bunch of optimizations for EXR playback. So sometimes people are just playing plates. Um, we want them to be able to do that in the engine as well. Uh, so with EXR, like there's a bunch of performance improvements to allow that. Um, next up is the end display config editor. So for anyone who's tried to configure end display before, it's in the past been a little bit challenging uh, with uh, the configuration file. It's something that is like kind of a little bit error prone, a um, little bit opaque. And it's just, you know, you can't really see what you're configuring, right? When you, when you show up to the wall, you just want to see, um, you know, you, as, you're, as you're like configuring the different screens, you want to be able to see it live. Uh, so that's what the config editor really sets out to achieve. Um, the config editor is like a new feature, lets you visualize all of the different display setups that you have. Um, you can create your cluster, arrange the viewports, and then map those viewports to different GPU outputs. Um, we've also consolidated all of the different blueprints in the past into like a single root actor. So all the parameters are together. These can be kind of scattered apart and hard to find. Um, for in-camera VFX specifically, um, you know, that stuff has been a big, big gain because of like the operators on stage will be changing things at a whole bunch of different places and they could get lost or not realize it's there. So now it's all consolidated in one place, make it easier to change and easier to address what the director wants in the moment. Um, and then last but not least, um, you can see, actually see the display cluster live in the level. So wherever you move uh, your end display actor, you can, you can see what the screens are gonna see um, live and in the editor. Uh, just takes the guesswork of work out of like positioning where you're, gonna, where you're gonna go and what you're gonna see. Um, next up is color science. Uh, so color science is a big, it's a big deal for filmmakers. Um, I mean, I think it's a big deal for everyone, um, but our goal here was to really make sure that like the, what the filmmakers get when they film a scene on the LED wall is accurate. So, um, you know, the, the big, I guess the big ticket idea here is that when our artists are creating the scenes in Unreal Engine, they're looking at it on their computer screen. Uh, what we want to do is match what they see uh, when they're creating the scene at the desktop to what the camera sees when the same scene goes through the LED wall. Um, so we're doing this with uh, some tech called Open Color IO. So we've had Open Color IO support uh, for a while, but now it's been extended to include end display. Uh, and we've also done um, kind of a lot of research and experimentation on like the process for doing this calibration. Uh, so we'll be sharing a bunch of documentation on that with um, with everyone, kind of just further the further the kind of discourse on um, you know what the right 
what the right way to approach this is and what the best practices are. Um, next up is level snapshot. So this is a little bit more of a workflow kind of pipeline tool that allows you to save and restore the state of a given level. Um, on stage, this is used a lot to say like, okay, we're shooting this scene in this area and then we're gonna shoot a bunch of shots there and then we're gonna move over to that scene and maybe we're doing some per shot changes. Um, so this lets the operators kind of keep everything in the same level, but like have sort of different snapshots that are used for different, um, you know, sort of setups, so to speak. Uh, level snapshots will basically take a snapshot of all the actors present in the scene. Um, and it'll also allow you to selectively restore things. So oftentimes the record will be like, you know, I want it to be like it was last week, but like everything except for the trees, leave those as they are. Um, you know, it, it just lets them be more flexible with, with uh, how they bring things back. Um, more on the tech side, you can define like customizable rule sets. So like if there's a common, you know, frequently used set of filters for restoring, uh, you're able to do that. Um, and we also support adding and removing actors. So like you take a snapshot and add something, it'll let you remove it and sort of vice versa. If you remove something, try to restore a snapshot, um, it'll help you bring it back. Um, next up is the multi-user editor, right? So multi-user has also been around for a while. It's kind of a critical component of how all of the machines talk to each other. It's how the, it's how, uh, the desktop operators can make changes that are then reflected on the LED wall. Um, it's been a lot of stability improvements for multi-user just so that it's just like solid and performing as expected, right? So any change you make is then propagated over uh, to the LED wall. Uh, we've also had some optimizations for creating large assets in session. Um, you know, a lot of this has to do with recordings in particular. Uh, we've improved save times and we've also um, added some additional like sort of nuances that are related to take recorder, um, which is primarily like this ability to from one client, like initiate recording on another client. Um, so that's kind of a big, a big workflow gain for, for the way that the operators choose to, to lay out what happens on which machine. Um, next up is the virtual camera, right? So kind of pivoting away a little bit more from the LED wall side of things. Uh, we have some updates to the virtual camera setup. Uh, so the main thing here is a dedicated iOS app, uh, just better UX for, for how you use the iPad vCam. Uh, this is gonna replace the Unreal Remote 2 app uh, we've also added uh, rebroadcast support for live link virtual subjects. Um, this is really useful, especially if you're using like a game controller to, to pilot the virtual camera. Um, and we've also, uh, you know, improved things for, for multi-user support just for, you know, who's controlling the camera when in a session. Uh, and then last but not least from my end is an update to the live link face. Uh, so this is another one of our iOS apps. Uh, and the main feature here is, is rest pose calibration. Uh, so this is really improving the live quality. It allows you to kind of account for the individual performer. Um, sort of in a nutshell, you, you can capture a rest pose that's specific to the, the person that's actually uh, you know, the person that's actually doing the facial capture. Um, and this is going to improve things, especially for like lip sync and like closed mouth uh, expressions. Uh, we record both the clean and calibrated data so you can get you know you can get back to both both ways if you want. Uh, and then we also have added support, proper support for iPad. So for those who have an iPad, but not an iPhone, um, you know, you have a more native experience and the, the, the UI is just going to sort of be proportioned correctly for iPad. That's it for me. Um, Andy is going to take over and uh, cover the rest of our virtual production stuff. Yeah, thanks so much, Ryan. Uh, next up, we're going to touch on the remote control uh, web UI that we've built. We have a full new kind of UX around this. Uh, the purpose of the web UI is to allow uh, the filmmakers the ability to easily kind of extract the controls that you want to control from inside the level, put them onto an easy touch interface uh, that's web-based that allows you to kind of with no scripting or anything required, attach properties to be able to be controlled from, you know, an iPad inside the volume. But because it's fully web-based, you could actually run it on any kind of device that you want. So you can kind of see in these examples here, um, you know, you can put color corrections uh, on there. You can put anything onto a slider that you want to control. So um, it makes it very easy and tactile to easily control properties inside the scene, the lighting direction, uh, color changes, all those kinds of things. And so we've built uh, corresponding web widgets that match all the properties. And I've shown some there, but you kind of see on the left-hand side, there's sliders, buttons, toggles, all the kinds of things that you'd want um, to be able to use. And it works fully with multi-user. So when you 
trigger these properties. It also will trigger uh, across the whole cluster uh, itself. Um, and so remote control has become, you know, a, a, a central piece for the filmmaker to be able to control their stage um, in an easy fashion. Uh, next slide. So along with that, we've extended this remote control area into also hardware devices. So we realize some people are using DMX, OSC and MIDI to control uh, parts of the engine. And what we've done is take this remote control plugin and allow you to also not just use web technologies, but also use those protocols. Uh, so with OSC, DMX and MIDI, a lot of times you have hardware control devices. So you can see on screen there, I have a little music MIDI controller that has dials on it and I can control say the camera's focus and I'm racking back and forth or I can bind it to the sun direction. And it allows um, you know, somebody to have a tactile feel and, and kind of build out these control systems in the way that they see fit. So all those changes again, kind of replicate through uh, both the multi-user and the end display system. So you can control the whole volume uh, in this way. And we built in some nice features that allow you to auto bind these properties. So you don't have to be a tech artist. You don't have to know blueprint. You can just expose the property, go to your MIDI device, turn the dial, it binds to that. Click uh, to let it know that you're done binding and then off you go. You can set the ranges and the limits. Um, so it's a pretty cool feature. I'm really excited to see where people take it um, with this next release. So next slide. Uh, next up is lens distortion. So we've invested uh, quite a bit on uh, getting a lens distortion pipeline up. This is our first pass uh, at putting in both a lens distortion shader, a process uh, in which you can calibrate your own lenses. So you can see on this example, uh, Trent is holding up a checkerboard there. So we use OpenCV uh, that's natively built into the engine now to uh, use image recognition to match those patterns. Um, and you can go ahead and derive basically all the lens distortion coefficients. Um, along with that, we can map the encoder. So if you have your zoom and your focus on your lens, um, we have pairs along those so that uh, your CG camera will match that physical camera. So it helps for depth of field matching. There's a process for calibrating the nodal offset as well uh, based on this image recognition. So it will automatically calculate where kind of the, uh, the nodal position of the lenses, which is always really tricky. And then we've also added the ability to import ST maps from Nuke. So a lot of the filmmaker uh, typically will go through the process of shooting these grids, processing them in Nuke, and then exporting uh, something called an ST map. And this allows for that same kind of workflow. Um, so you can see at the bottom there, we're getting results from the CG as we fade from the real life white, uh, and black checkerboard to the, the black and red checkerboard there and matching those you know, as accurately as we possibly can. So along with the tracking, we've added support for um, uh, to stream live values into the engine for uh, certain of the tracking providers along with the Preston uh, and Master Lockets um, devices as well. And one of the uh, small ones too is this 3D protocol support. So a lot of the robotic cameras, pan tilt zoom cameras um, utilize the 3D protocol and that's now native in the engine. Okay, you can go to the next slide. Uh, updates on Alembic. So uh, there's been some nice improvements for Alembic when it comes to motion blur. So if you're using geometry caches, especially ones that have subframe sampling, so you can see here in the example you're scrubbing through, you need subframe accuracy to happen to provide uh, the right kind of motion blur. So we have improved support for that, along with um, simulations that are happening. So if you have a fluid or explosion uh, that has starting off uh, from uh, empty frames, support for that that has definitely uh, been improved along with topologies that are not consistent um, uh, in allowing us to import those, those motion vectors. So there's been some nice improvements on the Alembic front. Next slide. So next up is the USD. Um, USD is a format that's becoming more and more popular in the industry, the universal scene description that was put out by Pixar. Um, in the filmmaking visual effects world, it's, it's one of those formats everyone is kind of looking at right now. We've had support in the engine for quite a while, but um, we're each release continuing to invest in that. Uh, in this release, we focused more on export capabilities to do interop between DCCs. So exporting levels, sub-levels, landscapes, foliage, 
uh, in animations. There's better caching support uh, in there now and um, allowing us to use this with uh, multi-user workflows as Ryan was describing. So being able to have a session where you could have USD data in it and have that propagate across all the other uh, nodes that are in the session. And we've also had improvements for uh, materials, uh, for MDL support and for runtime support. And next slide. Okay, so uh, the next up is DMX, um, pixel mapping. So if you're not familiar with this feature, uh, DMX's lighting data uh, comes into the Unreal Engine through a protocol called uh, DMX. And what we can do is sample a texture. So you can see at the bottom there, the rainbow pattern and send that out to lighting fixtures or uh, inside the engine virtually like capture uh, the texture as a, a render target and then display and match. So this comes into play if we wanted to match the lighting uh, in the scene, let's say inside the volume that Ryan had showed, but match the, the RGB values as close to reality as what we can. You can use a feature like this to do the pixel mapping and, and capture that and then drive real world physical lights with those same values. So really powerful feature. We've seen a lot of performance optimizations happening across the board uh, with this and better recording functionality. Uh, so it's, it's a lot more production ready uh, in this release compared to prior ones. And I think that's it uh, if you wanna advance and we can hand it over to Antoine. Hey everyone, um, Antoine here from Montreal. Let's uh, have a look at the new feature for AC and automotive. Um, so in 4.27, uh, we have some improvements to the movie render queue tool um, used to render uh, movies. And now we can set up to render stills. Um, so there's basically a tool that we create ready to render sequences from all the cameras in your scene or just a selection. And you can set up the, uh, the stills to have uh, presets and you can override those presets. So it could be uh, using CVARs to um, activate uh, effects or um, basically it's, uh, it's very handy when you want to render stills and it's kind of complex today to do it in, in, uh, in the sequencer. Um, so next slide, please. So in 4.27, we are um, adding new Datasmith exporter plugins. Uh, we are shipping a reworked SketchUp. So we had a SketchUp exporter before, but uh, we reworked it from the ground up. And we also have a Rhino exporter. Uh, those two plugins have direct link support uh, compatible with UV4, um, to some extent UV5. It's not been fully tested yet, but you can try if you want. And also Twinmotion. Also, the Revit plugin uh, received a number of improvements. And, um, okay, did I mention? Yeah, uh, we have also Archicad as well. Next slide, please. So on the CAD, um, on more the mechanical CAD uh, side, we have a new experimental plugin for SOLIDWORKS. Uh, this plugin supports geometry, product structure, materials, metadata, model variants, and is also uh, direct link capable. And we are looking to look forward to your um, assemblies in Unreal Engine. Next slide. So regarding the Datasmith runtime uh, plugin, uh, we have a number of improvements in 4.27, um, including some fixes, some new features, like the ability to have full scene hierarchy before you were limited to have uh, an actor that was kind of like a black box. You couldn't have access to your full scene hierarchy. Uh, now you have access to, access to everything, to your components. And you can also import your Datasmith scenes um, with settings like uh, simplified hierarchy. Uh, you can change the colliders as well. Uh, you can build collisions, complex collisions. You can use simple collisions. 
And you can also import and view metadata, which is very useful. Um, we also, in this release, added support for uh, directly PBR materials. And um, yep, that's it. Next slide, please. So regarding the, we have uh, some improvements as well with the LiDAR plugin. Um, we are looking into, we have looked into performance improvements regarding streaming as well as uh, editing tools. So you'll be able to change, modify your point clouds directly in Unreal. Um, if you can, oh, okay, the video is already running. So here we have um, a video of a, a church, uh, which is, it looks like a mesh, but it's actually a very, very dense point cloud. And it renders perfectly. It's really smooth and it's very, very cool to see. In 4.7, we also are adding master materials uh, with Datasmith. These materials will be included in the Datasmith content plugin. And um, the intent with these materials is to have a, um, a material compatible with the Datasmith format in Unreal and in Twinmotion as well. So it's a very easy way to set up your materials uh, without having to program a new shader. Uh, it's everything you need is probably in here. And it's very useful um, when you are creating, for example, plugins using the Datasmith SDK. Uh, next uh, slide, please. So to conclude, um, on this Unreal Engine release uh, and the Datasmith ecosystem, we are unifying our code base between Unreal Engine and Twinmotion to ensure full compatibility between the two tools. Um, these improvements enable a fluid design interaction with direct link, and users can collaborate and aggregate their content from a wide array of softwares, easily and efficiently use and import Datasmith scenes in editor or at runtime. So the direct link feature right now is available only at runtime. Twinmotion is an example of use of Datasmith runtime, but obviously you can create your own um, applications as well, package applications. Um, in this release, we are also allowing third-party developers to create their own Datasmith plugin. Um, we have, so we have a bunch of them here. Um, it's pretty pretty sweet to have every uh, kind of um, DCC export the Datasmith file, Datasmith scene, and import these in UE or Twinmotion. Um, the, to, re to recapitulate, the Revit, SketchUp, Archicad, and Rhino plugins are direct link, and the others allow you to export a Datasmith scene. Uh, next slide, please. And regarding, so we have a feature called Visual Data Prep in Unreal Engine. Um, this allows you to prepare your CAD and Datasmith files and to modify, for example, change materials, uh, build loads, simplify meshes, swap assets. And this allows you to have a very um, um, streamlined workflow and easy to just re-import your data from, from DCCs and have everything sorted out correctly. And in Visual Data Prep 427, we have some um, new features. So we have filters uh, like the jacketing and volume filters, which are going to be very, very useful. Uh, we also have some new operators like collision complexity, which has been asked for a while. So you can change the collision complexity of your meshes um, from simple to complex, as well as access to um, actor components, which is a new feature in 4.27. Um, so you'll have access to, for example, in your, um, uh, in your walls, you'll have access to millions, to your... Um, class components uh, and whatnot. And we also have a, a small revamp of the UI. Um, you can now group, collapse, or resize uh, data prep actions. And 
this is very useful to avoid clutter. Um, and also, the operator panel has been reworked. And you have a new statistic, statistic window, um, which is useful to pinpoint potential assets causing performance issues. Um, like uh, we have a lot of cases where uh, data is imported from um, external softwares and are millions. We ha we've had toilets with millions of polygons, for example, which is not very not very good for real-time rendering. Um, and we also have a new import setting uh, button for CAD files. Uh, so you'll be able to uh, change the, the import values for this. Uh, next slide, please. And finally, uh, we have improved the project templates uh, for AEC and, and automotive. So the Collab Viewer template now has OpenXR support. Uh, has an integration with Datasmith's runtime. Uh, and you also have new tools like um, a section box. Uh, you can set the ratio between the avatars and the world, which is very useful when you have massive worlds of very small objects. And we also are now shipping a new design configurator template, which is um, based, for, based on the, the old project configured template, but this one is dedicated to AEC uh, projects. And uh, yeah, we're looking forward to see what you guys do with it. And I'll hand, on it, hand it over to Chris for some rendering goodness. OK, hi, everybody. Um, so yeah, I'm going to talk to you about uh, the Path Tracer. Um, in 427, we're rolling out a number of improvements to the Path Tracer rendering mode. Uh, this is something that was introduced all the way back to Unreal 4.22. Uh, at the same time, we kind of introduced a lot of ray tracing features into the engine. Um, but it was uh, had no, always kind of had a number of limitations, uh, mainly because the team was just focused on polishing you know, all the real-time ray tracing aspects. Uh, but with 4.27, we're kind of gotten back to this project and implemented a good chunk of uh, the missing features. Uh, so just in case you haven't played with it before, uh, this is a rendering mode that's purely based on ray tracing. So there's no rasterization at all going on. Uh, and it does a full uh, brute force simulation of light transport in a scene, all the possible ways that light can bounce around. So it's uh, very accurate. Uh, it includes you know, full global illumination effects. Uh, it's not really intended to be real time at the moment. Uh, we kind of think of it as our reference quality solution that we use to kind of measure um, the quality of our real-time rendering modes against. Uh, so in particular, the path tracer has been really useful, for example, in the development of Lumen and UE5, kind of as a sanity check uh, of, you know, that is computing the right answer. Uh, but of course, we also think the path tracer is useful beyond just being a reference, uh, especially for folks that are like in the enterprise space, archviz, automotive manufacturing, uh, even film and TV, basically anybody that's looking for final quality pixels uh, without having to leave the engine. Um, so some of the things we've improved, uh, we've basically gone through all the major material types, uh, all the light types, and most of the light parameters. Uh, this includes things like you know, refraction, blend modes. Uh, we now have a reference quality random walk subsurface scattering, uh, just kind of the kind you might find in an offline renderer. Um, we've made a number of improvements to sampling kind of overall, uh, including how many lights are managed. Uh, previously, the path tracer had this kind of hard limit of 256 lights uh, that's mostly been lifted. Um, we've also integrated a denoiser that's uh, specific to the path tracer. So uh, this particular release, we're just shipping with Intel's open image denoise library. Uh, and it's really nice for just removing that bit of noise that's left over even when you have lots of samples. Uh, and we expect to kind of grow that list of supported denoisers in, in the future. Um, and also, we made sure that the path tracer could be used from movie render queue. So this allows you to, you know, get your final pixels. Uh, it includes motion blur, um, and yeah, it's a good way to, to do your final frame, final quality frame rendering. Uh, depth of field is also supported. Uh, at the moment, it's currently relying on Unreal's existing post process uh, depth of field, um, but um, yeah, we'll we'll be working on that on future releases. So uh, next slide. I just have an example, kind of what it looks like uh, in the editor. You've let it uh, accumulate for a few seconds. Uh, so this is, you know, a really simple example. It kind of just shows off the 
soft shadowing, accurate indirect lighting uh, that you can get uh, with the batch tracer. And if you look closely, uh, you can see some of the settings that are exposed uh, in the post-process volume. Uh, so there's intentionally very few settings. Uh, we just have number of samples, number of bounces. Uh, we set it up to do 32 bounces by default. You can definitely do more bounces if you want. Uh, there's some uh, anti-aliasing filtering quality settings, and that's basically it. Uh, next slide. Uh, this is an example of uh, a nice indoor scene that's uh, basically being lit only by the sun and sky. So aside from the light that's coming like directly through the window, everything else in the environment is uh, indirect lighting. So you even get the proper indirect lighting response uh, through the mirror. So if you played a bit kind of with the real time mode, you know that sometimes you get things looking pretty good uh, in most of your scene, but the quality in the reflections needs additional uh, tweaking. And so kind of one of the nice things about the path tracer is it removes all those technical steps uh, and technical decisions you have to make on the, the quality performance trade off. Uh, you know, of course, if you want real time performance, it's worth understanding all that stuff. Um, but if you just want nice looking images and don't mind, you know, waiting a few seconds, uh, that's, uh, the, the, that's what the path tracer is for. Um, Next slide, I have a few more uh, ArchViz interiors from some of our internal testing at Epic. Again, these are mainly lit with just sun and sky as the main light source. Uh, most of the lighting in these rooms is all indirect. Uh, next slide. Uh, Pass Racer is also really handy. Like if you have a, a model and you just want to kind of show it off. Uh, so here, one of our directors brought in a ZBrush sculpt into the ed editor just placed a few lights and got this result. Uh, so, you know, if you're an artist that works on just characters, props, environments, uh, the path tracer is kind of a nice way to just show off your models and do turntables without having to leave the engine at all. Uh, next slide, we have uh, an example of an uh, automa automotive uh, test scene. This one was rendered to a movie render queue, so it has motion blur um, on it as well. Um, you know, car paint is one of the supporting sh supported shading models now. So. Uh, there's you know, glass for the windshields and all that. So you can definitely do some nice uh, car renders. Uh, next slide. Um, this one is a more complex environment that the team at Quixel put, to put together for uh, the virtual production shoot you saw a bit earlier. Uh, this scene was kind of designed to look great in a real time mode, but just switching to the path tracer essentially worked out of the box, just a few minor tweaks to the, to the scene. Uh, and that was kind of exciting to see. Um, so, um, you know, of course, when you look through the release notes, you'll see we're not done yet with the path tracer. There's still a number of limitations, things that uh, we didn't have time to implement just yet. Maybe we'll talk about that in a Q and A later. Uh, that's why you know it's still marked as a beta feature. But you know, we hope to keep working on these and you know in the coming releases. Uh, next slide. Uh, so related to the path tracer, I just want to say a few words about uh, GPU light mass. You know, this is our GPU accelerated light baking solution. Uh, one of the key improvements here uh, was to basically bring all the improvements we made to the path tracer into this mode as well. So GPU light mass essentially is running uh, the same code as the path tracer. It's just a bit simplified because it's designed uh, just for baking uh, diffuse illumination, but it benefits you know, from all the other improvements we've made, like you know, uh, supporting all the light features, like uh, you know, rec light textures, barn doors, IS profiles, Things like that that are now supported in Path Tracer are also working in GPU light mass. Uh, it also supports the different blend modes, which means uh, we can uh, bake uh, color translucent shadows uh, now in, in GPU light mass. Uh, there's been a number of other uh, improvements, including you know better support for LODs. Uh, we've implemented uh, multi GPU support here, um, kind of related to the G multi GPU support uh, in the uh, VFX uh, in camera VFX workflows. Um, Sometimes you want to bake as, as quickly as you can. And so if you have multiple GPUs in your computer, that's, that's really nice. Um, and uh, yeah, finally, there's been a number of sampling improvements to volumetric light mat baking. So uh, those, those have a better quality and, and less time as well. Uh, so with that, I'll hand it back to Ryan to uh, talk about uh, pixel streaming. Cool. Uh, so I'm just going to jump in to say some quick words about pixel streaming. Um, so the pixel streaming, there's a few updates here. Uh, I think the main one is that uh, the team is considering it out of beta. Um, we also have really expanded the team that's working on uh, on the pixel streaming features. It's actually like a, a whole like UCS, which is like the cloud services team. Uh, there's an upgrade to, to there's an upgrade to WebR, WebRTC, you know, 
like a lot of general quality of life improvements and and uh, Linux support as well, which which is obviously really important since the, there's so many more Linux so many more Linux machines on the cloud. Um, and then the last thing to mention is that it's also available as a container. I think this is kind of a spoiler alert for the next slide, um, which talks about containers. Uh, so you know, developers that are that are in the cloud world are very accustomed to to working with containers. Uh, so the team has done a lot, has gone through a lot of effort to um, ship container images of 427. Uh, so just makes it a lot easier for them to to work with Unreal as a, as something they want to deploy to to any cloud setup. Um, that's kind of I guess all, all it really is to say. I mean, I think it's it, the, to a large degree the the container stuff has been a long time coming, and uh, hopefully this unblocks a lot of people to to leverage Unreal Engine in their cloud deployments going forward. Um, I think the last one will be covered by Amanda, right? Yep, that's me. So we just, we wanna make a few quick notes. Uh, we have a few things left. So we wanna to touch that Unreal Engine will be supported as a library. So you'll be able to build um, DUE4 runtime and interact with it through a very minimal um, built-in API. Uh, so, you know, that means you can integrate a UE viewport inside a Windows application, and then that gets compiled as a DLL. Um, so you'll be able to accept command lines, um, run in a client window uh, that you'll be able to send uh, where the engine can send its output to. You can interact with like Windows messages for interprocess communications and, you know, shut down the engine when you're done with it. So uh, you as the user can certainly expand the API to suit your needs, um, whether that's exposing existing or new functionality for your external use. Um, next slide, please. We're gonna touch on some of the rad new tools from Rad Game Tools. Um, so first of all, with um, the Oodle data compression, um, some of the like fastest and highest ratio compressors, which is really awesome. So there's four different algorithms uh, that you can select from to best fit your project's needs. Um, in 427, these will be enabled by default. And uh, it means, you know, you'll load your package projects faster. So hopefully that helps you um, in your typical work sessions. Uh, for Oodle Texture, they're again, like high quality encoders for block pressed BC1, BC7 textures. Um, and these can help make the visual quality encodings two to three times smaller than non-RDO encoders. Uh, this is also going to be enabled by default and you can, um, the RDO encoding itself can be, is off by default, uh, but you can enable it in your project settings. And then um, with Oodle Network, the idea here is you're gonna be reducing your bandwidth required by game servers um, and significantly reducing the bandwidth required for your multiplayer games, which just a, a great experience for everybody. So next slide. With Radbank Video, um, it's a popular video codec, and again, it'll be built into Unreal Engine, like the Oodle compression will be. Um, the cool thing for you devs is it'll decode up to 10 times faster, and it's using 8 to 16 times less memory. Um, it could also be potentially offloaded into GPU compute shaders for faster performance. Um, and uh, Bink Video is totally self-contained. You don't have to install anything else. Um, and the interface, the plugin infer interface is meant to be super simple, really easy to use. So um, just a couple of notes there. That's all we have for um, us today. We are going to, there are many more features and improvements that will be coming in 427 that we haven't covered today. Uh, we will be doing future streams where we go in-depth and hands-on with a variety of these features. So don't think this is the end all be all of 427 information. We'll certainly be getting more out your way. But if you have questions for the folks on stream today, we're going to dive right into those. So I know we've already got some that we'll start answering, but if you have questions for the team, uh, feel free to drop those in chat preceded by question. Um, I also think Steve's gonna join us again. So if you wanna hop back on, Welcome back, Steve. Um, all right, diving into questions. So I know some of you all have been asking, what's the official recommendation for developing in the coming months since um, we've forked to UE5 and marching there? So we absolutely recommend, feel free to go ahead and dive into 427. The um, 427 will absolutely be compatible with UE5. We recommend you following that path. Um, 
what the caveat there is, you cannot take your 427 projects into UE5 early access um, because of that, that fork, but you should not feel concerned in any way of jumping to 427, that won't hurt you going into Unreal Engine 5. Let's see, we've got, is path tracing from Displace, is path tracing in 427 going to support decals and possibly in the future, things like volumetrics? Yeah, thanks, <clears throat> that's a good question. So um, we don't have a decal support in there right now. Uh, in 427, this is actually an area that's being um, kind of refactored a lot uh, for Unreal Engine 5. So because those code bases are diverging, we didn't want to risk uh, you know, porting that to, to 427. Um, but uh, it's definitely high on the list of things to bring to UE5. Uh, as far as volumetrics, uh, that's a little further down, down the line, but uh, we're definitely supported, planning on supporting that in the path tracer at some point. Awesome. All right, from Mr. Forgusi, uh, I think this is for you, Steve. Um, you had mentioned wanting to do non-DR phobiated rendering stuff, um, but they're very curious, nice and cryptic, uh, very curious what you're thinking of. So that was deliberately cryptic because uh, uh, we don't know completely yet, but uh, I know there's some prior work that um, the coalition did um, using uh, edge detection filters with VRS. They got some pretty good results. Um, you know, applying this tech for, for VR is a slam dunk just because of the, the lens distortion, the option for foveated rendering with eye tracking and all that stuff. So, you know, that's, that's an easy one and it's, it's, a, it's a pretty big win for not a huge amount of thinking involved. Um, but I think just, just given the amount of performance we can get back with that, um, there's, there's a ton of options. And over the, over the coming like six to 12 months, we're gonna start thinking about what, what those will be and, uh, and really start digging in and seeing what we can get out of that. But I don't have any, anything that's not cryptic yet. <laughs> it's always the soon TM, right? It's soon, yeah. It'll happen <laughs> though. It's worth it. It's good stuff. Excellent. Um, Ryan, I think this was while you were presenting. So from a coup, they were asking, will it work with GTX or is it only for Quadro? Um, I think that was in reference to multi-GPU or um, in display maybe? Yeah, so um, so multi-GPU like will work with both. Uh, when in the, for the purposes of the LED wall though, you generally want and need to use the Quadro cards for the Quadro sync feature. Uh, that's what allows for like all the different screens to be synchronized and then also synchronized with uh, the frame rate of the camera. Uh, so for in-camera VFX purposes, like you pretty much need to go with the Quadro cards for the um, for the LED wall, but like for GPU light mass and GPU, um, you you can use the um, you can use like either uh, like since 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 the sync is not a factor and that's actually something that we do a lot when we're using gpu light mass in relation to the states like sometimes we'll just have a machine that's using the the non-quadro cards to do the the, the light bakes uh, and that works fine cool thank you uh i know we've had in the chat i just want to address this we've had quite a few questions about water systems i don't know that anybody on this call is ready to address <laughs> the state of those but if you Feel free if anybody is, but if not, um, feel free to follow up on the forum post uh, for the uh, stream today and we can chase down the folks to maybe get some updates on that for you. Um, sorry, I'm not gonna try and pronounce your name, but there was asking if there's gonna be a white paper on the OCIO, the open color IO. Um, I know Andy, you believe we'll have some more information coming with the release, right? Yeah, there's some documentation that's coming. Ryan alluded to some of it describing the process of uh, color management for the LED walls, but in general, um, more information about open color IO, kind of the touch points for where it hits in the engine. So both in the end display, movie render queue, um, and overall workflows. I think you're gonna see more of that um, in the future to come. Yeah, specifically on the white paper aspect, like we have a document that we're getting ready to go for, like to go along with the release. Um, and then we're also hoping to do some additional like supplemental material that just shows like the process for caliber that we did the color calibration and then potentially some of the, the data as well. Um, that'll probably come after the release, but it is something we're kind of getting in the works to share. Uh, since it's like a, it's like a big topic and um, hopefully that'll help people give people more of a frame of reference for our process. Perfect. Thank you. 
um, from this is CBC uh, regarding ro remote control protocol binds. They're wondering if this is an editor only feature and specifically would the created binds be accessible in a in package sessions? Sure, you know, that's a great question. Um, so we do focus on editor and actually dash game. There is some difference in package builds. So not all properties are supported in the same binded way. We're, we're looking at it for this next release, um, trying to make sure that we can match as best we can. Currently, you'll see at the left-hand side of that special details panel, the remote control preset, there'll be a little warning that says this will not display in package game. So you can definitely go ahead and try it out, but we try to warn you if there's something that's not going to work correctly or is expected in a package build. So, Perfect. Thank you. Uh, from Y2K Maddie, is uh, UE4, will, will it have any option of ACES color space? Uh, I can answer that one too. So on the ACES side, we do support, as I was mentioning, open color IO, which ACES is as well like a color space that's used uh, throughout open color IO. And so there are certain points where we have uh, access points for ACES. Um, this person, if you come from the VFX space, you may be thinking of like texture import and stuff like that that follows the same kind of color management process throughout the pipeline. I would say that we don't have 100% full ACES in and out, but we do have the display and render portions of that covered now through open color IO. Um, but it's something that we're continually, you know, it's a multi-year release of getting in small features. So look for more, we're definitely headed in that direction. Um, but yeah, currently it's focused on those two areas. Awesome. Right. From Claro Lima, uh, will we have camera perspective correction for ArcVis in 427 or UE5? I think that's you, Antoine. Yep. So um, this is a this has been requested for a while. Um, this is not going to be a feature for four twenty seven, but we are looking into solutions and new tools, um, including perspective correction in UE five. Uh, probably not the release five point zero, but one of the later releases. Awesome. I've had a couple of questions around LiveLink uh, VCAM or the next update to LiveLink Face. I know you were asking about the um, facial calibration update. And so uh, I think Ryan, you were mentioning it'll be. Yeah, so both of those uh, will are meant to go to the App Store, the iOS App Store, like uh, day and date with the, the 427 release. So we'll have those timed up. Um, I saw there was another question I was asking about LiveLink Face and translation. Uh, so maybe that person could, uh, I, I'm not quite understanding that question. So maybe a little bit more uh, context on what you meant and we can try to answer that as well. Yeah, so Thomas Halpin, if you could expand on what you mean by, uh, will it include translation? We can follow up on that for you. Um, another from Aku, will multi-user system uh, still require Git or can you, um, can't you just join server and download everything there is on it? Yeah, so you don't have to use source control with multi-user if you don't want to. Um, there is like a mode that you can run that that like um, that makes the, the the checks that it does less strict. Um, and tech, yeah, so if you are uh, you know if you run the multi-user session from the beginning uh, and you keep it going, um, then yeah, another set, another client could join and it'll just grab all the assets that you've. Uh, Created like in general, what you need to do is sort of start from the same place. So if you started from an empty project and kept the session going, um, the other people that joined would, would get the same stuff. Awesome. Thanks. From Gregor Punchatz, how is hair working with path tracing? Uh, so not working today. Um, it's not part of 427, but that's definitely high on our priority list of uh, something to look into. Yeah, so there's there's a lot of components to that. Obviously, there's the, the geometric side, being able for rays uh, to intersect the hair, and then supporting the actual hair shading model. Uh, but yeah, we definitely want um, the path tracer to support those uh, going forward. So it's on the list. Great. From Shanathan Hansen, is 427 going to be the last UE4 version before going to UE5? So um, that is our current plan of record. Um, I think that. We don't anticipate additional releases. So for 27, you know, get in, get updated, and we'll begin the march to UE5. 
Um, obviously, if that ever changes, we'll let you all know. So, for from Andy Fedick, will there be an option for third party renderers instead of the path tracer? Uh, yeah, so I can say a few words about that. Um, there's basically nothing preventing a third party renderer from trying to integrate. And actually, I think the V Ray team uh, has a V Ray for Unreal plugin already. So it definitely can be done. Uh, and we're definitely happy if people try to do that. Uh, but, um, you know, we'll, we'll keep um, improving the path tracer uh, as kind of the built in solution. And if any other vendors want to look into adding support, that's, that's great too. Thanks. Oh, uh, regarding GPU light mass, is that playable or just render? Um, I, I think uh, what this is asking is just, um, I'm not sure exactly what the question is asking, but basically GPU light mass is meant for uh, baking the lighting into the environment so that at, when, you, when you play the, the level, um, the, the lighting is super fast uh, to evaluate um, and, and basically real time. Uh, so it's actually one of the faster uh, lighting solutions. The only compromise is that it's, it's pre-baked and it's not dynamic, um, but yeah. So it, it's meant to be playable. The actual baking process, of course, takes a few minutes depending on the size of your level. Um, but uh, once you've baked, everything is playable. Perfect. And another one around GPU last GPU light mass. Um, is there support for AMD cards as well? I believe there is. Uh, so everything ray tracing related in Unreal Engine is based on just uh, DXR, um, which is you know the kind of cross vendor solution on Windows. Mm -hmm. And you know there's nothing NVIDIA specific there. Um, so yes, I believe everything works on AMD cards. We do a lot of testing on NVIDIA first, generally, but um, AMD should be supported. Excellent. Thanks. From Thomas Franklin, um, they're asking, they've noticed that some of the templates um, have been removed for UE5 early access at least. And they're asking if 427 will have limited templates too. Um, and Antoine, you were ready to jump in on this one. <laughs> Yeah, uh, this is just for UE5 early access. UE, UE427 is going to have all the templates and even more, uh, like the ones I mentioned earlier in the stream. Awesome. From Zyanum, are these container images of the editor or for built projects? So my understanding is that it's both, um, that it will help you cover it. Like there's, there's uh, the options provided will facilitate both. And then on the topic of containers um, from Loresh, uh, do we support Windows, Linux, or both for containers? Yeah, and that one is both also. Perfect. Uh, we did have a follow-up um, regarding the live link face um, regarding translation. So the comment was, there is rotation. Can there be a switch that controls motion in, the, in XYZ in space, like moving the head forward, backward, and side to side? Um, that's a good question. Um, I'm sure. <laughs> I'm not totally sure because, like, in, in, in we're we're basically just passing along the data that you get from AR. Could actually, Steve may know the answer for this. Um, if you get this info from from there, um, mm -hmm. like that's a good question. It seems like it would be possible to do, um, but I don't know if that's like. It's something we'll have to take back, and probably I will ask Steve about it later. Because um, I think the facial capture aspect of AR, AR Kit is like separate from the other tracking features of AR Kit. So I, I don't know if that's something that we could do together. Although it is an interesting idea. Yeah, we should definitely chat about that. All right now, it is on the discussion <laughs> um, from John Kenzel. Uh, they wondered your thoughts about bringing DataSmith to Blender. So Blender is not currently in the plans, but we are always evaluating for new DCC software support. Mm -hmm. um, so look at the news, maybe at some point. <laughs> Keep a lookout. <laughs> um, 
from the Koala Wolf is LifeLink Face going to add features related to VTubing? Yeah, so I mean, this is another one maybe that would be good for a follow up. I would be very interested to hear what you think like are the types of features that would help facilitate you doing VTubing better. Um, I think that that's something that would be awesome to get the face using for. I know Victor's not on the stream, but it's something that he and I have discussed in the past as well. Uh, so definitely interested to hear um, what we could what we could provide that would that would make it easier for for that type of work to be done. Uh, let's see. And from Captain Burner, is there going to be a direct link for 3ds Max? So there is going to be one. We just started development. Uh, this, is, this is very early for now, uh, but we are working on a, a new data space plugin for 3ds Max that supports direct link. Awesome. That'll be exciting. Yeah, no, no um, release date yet, but we are working on it. Awesome. Let's see. I know I've got a few more questions coming in. Um, I know you all are asking about uh, chaos. We'll still be doing a, um, like with 426, I believe we're doing a 427 chaos build explicitly that is separate um, and we're not enabling chaos by default for 427. Um, my understanding is that will be coming in uh, UE5. So keep checking it out, keep exploring it. Um, but at this, at this point in time, you'll be seeing it with the UE5 release. Um, and that was from Jacob. Bra oh gosh. Gurix Blas workflows. Can we expect to see to visualize VDBs with the upcoming path tracer? And if yes, what could be the source, such as true USD directly from Houdini? Yeah, so um, VDBs would probably follow uh, fall in the category of you know volumetrics in the path tracer, which, like I said, it's it's on the list. Uh, something we're looking forward to doing, but uh, not doing it just yet. Um, the only other thing I'll mention with VDBs is, you know, we don't want to add, we're trying to keep uh, the path tracer kind of at feature parity with the rest of the engine. So we don't want to just add features that would only work in the path tracer. If we are going to add support to something in the path tracer, we want it to work throughout the engine. So um, yeah, no, I don't have any uh, concrete uh, timelines on when uh, direct VDB support will, will go in, but um, it's definitely something that's that we're aware of and that'll be that we'll be thinking about, yeah, UE5. Thank you. Um, so the same from the real Svein man, uh, they're asking uh, regarding the over the internet multi-user editing um, sometimes has troubles connecting with VPN and servers. In their experience, are there improvements coming to remote workflows? Yeah. So I guess the first thing I would mention on that is there. Are like last summer, we did for, um, we did create some additional documentation for helping people do that, especially since there was like an uptick from people working from home trying to do this stuff. So maybe I'll pop onto the Twitch stream and just post that that doc because it does at least guide you through a lot of the networking settings and considerations that you have to make. Um, longer term, I think um, this is definitely something that we want to that we want to do better uh, with the feature set, and it's something that we're working with the cloud services team on. Um, to better facilitate. So there's the potential to, you know, more easily run the multi-user sessions in the cloud, uh, be able to connect, um, you know, much, much easier uh, without, without the need to like get into a lot of these esoteric settings. Um, so that's something that we hope to improve like more in the UE5 timeframe, um, but it's definitely um, on our minds for, for multi-user collaboration. Awesome. Well, I think that's, the questions that we're going to be jumping on today. So first of all, I wanted to absolutely thank you all for joining us. Um, it's been a pleasure having you walk through all these awesome features that we're gonna see in the upcoming release of 427. We're really excited to get them out in the wild, get all of you um, exploring the new features and um, seeing what you're gonna make with it. There's some really cool stuff coming in this update and. Uh, you all always blow us away. Like we're watching all the stuff even in preview. So y'all knock our uh, socks off with uh, with your community projects. We love them so much. But um, as we will be 
jumping off here shortly, just a couple of reminders. Do tune in next week. We'll be having uh, the team from Houdini on to join us. They're going to talk about Project Titan and some Side Effects Labs uh, updates for y'all. Um, always really, really cool stuff. Uh, follow us on all of our social channels, Twitter, YouTube, uh, YouTube Facebook, whatever, for regular updates. Um, and, you know, definitely jump in the forums if you have questions or comments or anything like that. As far as um, the topics today, if there were additional questions or you think of stuff, we can always come back to the forum thread that's the event forum thread and check it for any additional follow-ups there. And yeah, again, thank you all. We hope you have an absolutely wonderful week. Thank you to all of you who joined us today here on the show. Antoine, Andy, Steve, Chris, and Ryan, y'all are rock stars. Love seeing you. And uh, yeah, we'll see you all next week. Take care, everyone. <laughs>